The year starts with a lunar occultation of Uranus on January the 1st, but you need to be in Greenland, Northern Europe, or Northeast Russia to see it. And as Uranus is not naked eye visible, you will need some binoculars, a telescope, or a digital camera to help you see the event. However, two days later, on January the 3rd, there's a lunar occultation of Mars. And as Mars is naked eye visible, this is an event that you can enjoy without a visual aid. You need to be in sub-Saharan Africa, so South Africa or Madagascar, in order to enjoy the event. Then at the end of January, there's another lunar occultation of Mars. This time you need to be in the Southwest or South US, as well as Mexico and Central America. And again, if you're not in those regions, the Moon and Mars will still appear very close to one another. On January the 22nd, there's a conjunction between Venus and Saturn. You can catch them in the western skies just after sunset. And then a day later, on January the 23rd, they'll also be joined with a very thin crescent moon. This is a really nice photographic opportunity. On February the 22nd, there's a close encounter of the Moon and Jupiter, and just underneath them in the west after sunset will be Venus. If you're in Chile or Argentina, you'll also get to see a lunar occultation of Jupiter, where the Moon will pass in front of Jupiter and block it from view. From that day on, Jupiter and Venus will continue to get closer and closer until they come to conjunction on March the 1st. You can catch them in the southwest or the western the skies in the evening shortly after sunset. On March the 24th, there's a lunar occultation of Venus, and in order to see this, you need to be in South Africa or Central Asia. A nice waxing crescent moon will block Venus from view temporarily. At the beginning of April, there's a really nice opportunity to see Venus nearby Pleiades, also known as the Seven Sisters, and they are at their closest on April the 11th. On April the 20th, Lucky Sky Watchers on a thin line that cuts through the Eastern Hemisphere will get to experience a solar eclipse, and it's a rare hybrid solar eclipse, where in some regions it will be a total eclipse, but in other places it will be an annular eclipse, otherwise known as a ring of fire, because the moon is not close enough to completely block the sun from view like a total eclipse. The thin corridor of the maximum eclipse will pass through the Ningaloo coast of Western Australia, where it will appear total, and then stretch through the West Papua province of Indonesia and sweep across the islands of Micronesia, where the eclipse becomes annular. There's also a region outside of that thin corridor where people will still be able to enjoy a partial eclipse, and that includes a much larger region of Australia, all of Indonesia and Papua New Guinea. April brings us the Lyrid Meteor Shower, which is active from the 16th to the 25th and is expected to peak on the night of the 22nd into the 23rd. This year, a thin crescent of a 9% illuminated moon won't hinder the view as it sets early in the evening on the 22nd, leaving the pre-dawn hours perfectly dark to enjoy the show. If you get away from the city lights, you can enjoy as many as 20 to 30 shooting stars per hour. The radiant point of the meteor shower is near the bright star Vega in its namesake constellation Lyra, so it's best seen from the northern hemisphere, although if you're in the southern hemisphere, you can face north and still see meteors just to expect the numbers to be lower. The Lyrids are known to deliver bright and impressively fast streaks across the night sky which do often leave persistent trains, and it often has a surprise burst of activity on rare occasions known as an outburst where sometimes you can get hundreds or even thousands of meteors per hour. Will we have one this year? Who knows? There's only one way to find out. Now guys, if you want to make sure that you don't miss any of the events in 2023, make sure you have my What's in the Night Sky calendar. It features 12 of my images captured over the past couple of years, and significant astronomical events are pre-written into the date boxes. And if you want to be able to photograph these events in the best possible way, you should check out my book, Photographing the Night Sky. It is the encyclopedic guide to landscape astrophotography. There'll be links in the video description down below. On May the 17th, there's a lunar occultation of Jupiter for those in Canada, USA, Mexico, Greenland, and the very northern reaches of Europe. For the rest of us, the Moon and Jupiter will still be very close to one another in the night sky. On June the 1st and the 2nd, Mars buzzes through the Beehive Cluster. This will be a really nice view and opportunity for those with binoculars and telescopes. 
And then about 10 days later, on June the 12th and 13th, it's Venus's turn to be the queen bee of the beehive cluster. July brings us the first of four supermoons of this year, all four of them in consecutive order throughout the summer months, and if this is an unmissable night sky event, then every full moon rise should be an unmissable night sky event, because to be honest, you can't tell the difference between a supermoon and a regular moon with the naked eye. But for some reason, giving it a fancy name gets people excited to get out and enjoy the full moon. Towards the end of July, you can catch Mercury, Venus and Mars in the western skies shortly after darkness falls. And on July the 19th, the 20th and 21st, they'll be passed by a thin crescent moon. August the 1st brings us the second supermoon of the year, and August the 31st brings us the third supermoon of the year, making that a super blue moon, under the definition that a blue moon is the second full moon in a calendar month. The older definition of blue moon is the fourth full moon within an astronomical season, which brings about the phrase once in a blue moon. But August also brings us one of the best meteor showers of the year, the Perseid Meteor Shower. It's expected to peak on the night of the 12th into the 13th, where in a dark sky location you can expect 50 to 60 meteors per hour. Luckily this year the peak coincides with a dim waning crescent moon, so viewing conditions are nearly as good as they can get. And this is an event where you don't need binoculars or a telescope. You could just get out there and enjoy it with your naked eye. But I highly recommend you try to get away from light pollution as much as you possibly can. The radiant point is within the constellation Perseus, which rises in the northeast in the late evening and climbs higher into the sky as the night goes on. That makes this meteor shower favourable to those in the northern hemisphere, but if you are in the southern hemisphere, you should face north in the pre-dawn hours and just expect the number of meteors to be lower. September the 29th brings us the fourth and final supermoon of the year, but this one, in my opinion, is a bit more special than the others because it is the harvest moon, which is the closest full moon to the autumn equinox. This moon rises and sets during the twilight hours at such a time where it seems to linger in the sky in these gorgeous orange-yellow colours, and if you're in the countryside, sometimes the dust in the air from the harvest in tractors causes the colour of the moon to be even more exaggerated. On October the 14th is another annular solar eclipse, otherwise known as a ring of fire. The thin path of annularity runs through the Americas, starting from Oregon, down through Nevada, Utah, New Mexico and Texas, before crossing the Gulf of Mexico and then over parts of Central America, Colombia and Brazil. Whilst there won't be many people directly on that path, those who are close to the path will still get to experience a partial solar eclipse. During the last three months of the year, there are three opportunities to capture what is my favourite moon and planet meeting in the night sky, and that's a thin crescent moon with Venus. There's opportunities on October the 10th, November the 9th, and December the 9th. You need to face east in the pre-dawn hours. And I love that you get the impressively bright Venus taking on the moon and also the dark side of the moon being illuminated by earth shine. So three really nice photographic opportunities at the end of the year. The meeting on November the 9th is a lunar occultation for those in Europe, Northeast Africa and the Middle East. The year ends pretty much with the best fireworks show of the year in the Geminid Meteor Shower. The peak is expected on the night of December the 13th into the 14th, where from a dark sky location you can expect about 100 to 120 meteors per hour. It is, in my opinion, the one that actually feels like what most people expect a meteor shower to be. This year it's timed pretty closely to the new moon, so there's not going to be any moonlight hindering the show. This is one of the most exciting events of the year, in my opinion. With the radium point in the constellation Gemini, it does somewhat favour the northern hemisphere, but those of you in the southern hemisphere would be wise to face north, and I'm sure you'll still see plenty of meteors. And that's all I've got for you guys. Hit subscribe if you haven't already so you don't miss out on my monthly What's in the Night Sky videos where I go into much more detail. And there's also competitions where I give away prizes like my book, Photographing the Night Sky, my calendar or my Astro Workflow Lightroom presets. 
let me know in the comments down below which one you're most looking forward to. And if you're going out to enjoy the night sky anytime soon, I wish you good luck and clear skies.